A massive storm, almost 1,000 miles wide. This is going to be a big and powerful storm. With the destructive power of an atomic bomb. A natural disaster of extraordinary force strikes the northeast coast of the United States. Don't mess with Mother Nature. Never seen anything like this. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. It's a hurricane. You would never think this was happening in New York. 50 homes already have burned to the ground. This is unbelievable, man. I've uh, never witnessed anything like this. Oh, my God! Unbelievable. I'm sorry. Hey, Heather, it's Michelle. Um, hi. Uh, I don't know. I can't even, uh, I don't even know what to say. Um, I'm just happy that we're alive. There's, um, uh, we're all just sort of, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, power. There's no service. There's no phones. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's like a scene out of some end-of-the-world movie. The people on America's East Coast wake to Sandy's aftermath. This was a storm of almost unimaginable power. Sandy's impact was felt along the coastline from Florida to Massachusetts before she made landfall. Then the storm blew an ocean into the heart of New York City. Oh my God! With such devastating power, she grows to a superstorm. Uh oh, uh oh. Terrifying millions of people. Try to keep it up somehow. Sandy is definitely coming into New York City and making a huge mess. This was our home, you know? I mean, I'm sorry. Almost 200 people are dead. Sandy has caused an estimated $50 billion worth of damage, and more than 8 million people are without power. This is the story of a tragic and never-to-be-forgotten 24 hours in the life of Superstorm Sandy. Hurricane Sandy has already struck the Caribbean, claiming more than 70 lives. 90 miles off the coast of North Carolina, she claims one of her first American victims. Altitude. Roger, stand by and hold. U.S. Coast Guard's brave storm force winds to save the desperate crew of an historic tall ship that has been sunk in 18-foot waves. Survivors getting out of the basket. They pull 15 people from the water, but one woman is unresponsive. Resuscitation attempts fail. Come on, Dan, reach that. 42 year old Claudine Christian has a unique and tragic distinction in the history of Superstorm Sandy that day. She was the first American life to be taken by Hurricane Sandy. Such a little spark and, and firecracker in life. Just couldn't believe she was just taken. And, uh... Claudine had been a crew member on the three-masted sailing ship, HMS Bounty. Swimmers at basket, hold. The ship's captain, Robin Walbridge, is missing at sea. The search for the captain will later be abandoned. With Sandy powering towards land, scientists at the National Hurricane Center are deeply concerned. Things have really changed from a couple days ago. Hurricane Sandy now has maintained its strength. The hope that this system would steer out to sea is, is, is gone. Now the fact that it looks like it will hit the northeast, still do not know the exact location of where the storm will hit. If this forecast is right, 
this is going to spell uh, it's going to be a major disaster in the Northeast. Um, you know, we're talking about a multi-billion dollar storm and uh, maybe a record-setting event. We really should start to be prepare for something that could be a very devastating event. Hard reality is that even if we do everything with our power to prepare, we can't stop the storm. I've been hearing about evacuate for, uh, since we've been here. Those who choose to stay are going to find themselves in this situation. If they do get in trouble, we will not go for it. We'll ride it out. We'll ride it out like we ride all of them out, you know? Yeah, we're not looking forward to it. Getting too old for this. We have never left the house or evacuated in the past. We are staying. The storm should be felt as far away as Michigan and parts of Ohio. This is an unprecedented situation and everyone should really be uh, taking heat. In the early afternoon, the outlying winds reach the heart of New York City. Then the storm hits a Long Island suburban street. This is the apocalypse. Oh! I heard the kids downstairs uh, joking around, kidding around, playing. Oh my, oh my god! Our tree! Yeah. What? Our tree! Oh. <laughs> Dad! It hit your car! Oh my god! Oh my god! It hit my car! Oh, my car! They reached a point in time I realized it, it wasn't joking. They were screaming something was going on. I wasn't expecting anything really. Just thought that the storm wasn't even going to be that big of a deal. I was just deciding to film a video out my window, maybe send it to my friend. And then uh, I just captured something crazy on film. Oh my god! Oh my god, that all on film! I was on the computer and I heard him. And I looked out the window to see the tree falling. And I screamed first because the tree was falling. And then I realized it was about to hit my car. The wind didn't look that bad, but it snapped like a twig. Oh! What happened? Their car got crushed! I felt like I was in like a horror movie watching all these trees falling around my house because when it's your home turf, like when it's your house seeing it happen, it's just, a, you're in a state of shock. What's What's right right the danger here are trees falling and they have happened in the past where they kill people. Thanks. It's eerie because it's, it's almost like silence until it makes contact with whatever it's hitting. Then you just hear like, you know, like, an unstable crushing of metal. I was scared throughout the whole entire night. It was horrible. Felt like I was in a horror movie. Get up, let's get away from oh, it. There's a fire. There's a fire, Dad. There's a fire, Dad. Oh my God. There ain't nothing I can do about that. Oh my God. Trees are crashing down everywhere. But it isn't just wind causing the problem. The storm is so slow moving that it lingers over the northeast, saturating the ground below. We also had a lot of rain right before that system came. So that was like the setup for losing a lot of trees. You soften the ground, it's moist, you lose a lot of trees. It's late afternoon on the coast of New Jersey. Waves are growing by the minute. Waiting for the hurricane to hit is storm chaser Jeff Petrowski. Winds are gusting to 85 miles an hour off the coast now. Just had a weather report that says south of Boston, the cement's going to put. Winds gusting to 89 miles an hour. Other storm chasers are also descending on what promises to be a dramatic event. Sandy is really beginning to make itself felt here at the north shore of Long Island. You can see the flooding behind me. In fact, I'm up to my knees in water right now. Now this is the first high tide, and the surge isn't all that big. The secondary high tide, which comes later on tonight, when the surge is much higher, this whole area is likely to flood out far more. The hurricane is now approaching the coastline. It's only gonna get worse from here. With night falling, Jeff is getting ready for the storm surge. Look at the water! Look at the storm surge on the Garden State Parkway! Looks like a dam is broke. I mean, it is pouring across the garden. This is bad. Hurricane Sandy has struck the east coast of the United States. Water is wreaking havoc on homes in Brooklyn. Just a 
gushing everywhere. The water was covering the, the street completely. And um, you couldn't see the road anymore. After a while, we're gonna see water literally start flowing back down the steps to the basement, the way we were. And then suddenly out of the blues, you know, the, the door broke open. Oh my God! Oh my God! The door broke open. It's as though the river, a river or even the ocean was gushing in. The door just broke open. And at that point, even I got scared. This was as though somebody had sort of diverted the sea to the house. It's moving faster than you can think or faster than you can act. Should we try to close it? No, but we need to try to close the door. This water just came in like if it was the ocean coming into the, with so much force. Sandra, careful. Suddenly, and the power went, and that was a very, very scary moment. Power is failing all over the region, but things are about to get worse because seawater and electricity are not a good mix. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. It's the hurricane. What the hell is this? In this one spectacular flash, a substation blows up, cutting power to almost one million New York City homes. Local resident John Matauzi captures the explosion on video. I started walking down to the water. The flood was starting to come up. It was about two feet by then. This area right here was like a crazy wind tunnel. It felt like 100 mile per hour gusts. I mean, you had little girls that were like grabbing on the trees like this, holding on for their life. It got pretty dangerous over here because there was these metal sheets that must have weighed like 30 pounds that were just woof, 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 flipping through the air. And then all of a sudden my camera just lit up. Then we get another huge flash, a blue blast. I mean, it looked, looked like something out of a sci-fi movie. And everyone started screaming. Some were just kind of like, oh my God, you know, in that sort of apocalyptic sense that New Yorkers have been feeling, uh, I mean, you, you felt it. Something, yeah, just exploded. When Manhattan went out, the, the New World Trade was actually one of the only things that was lit. So it looked really unreal, because half of Brooklyn Bridge was out, all of Manhattan, and then this big tower was glowing. And eventually that went out. And throughout the night, you'd see these blue explosions in the distance. Which became extremely spooky. It looked like something out of, you know, Independence Day. By nightfall, Superstorm Sandy has left millions of New Yorkers without basic amenities. Communications are breaking down and the emergency services are stretched to the limit. There are almost 20,000 emergency calls an hour. That's about 300 calls a minute, five every second. With phone lines down, Sandy's victims turn in desperation to social media. Hundreds of tweets per minute are now arriving at the New York Fire Department's headquarters. Social media manager Emily Rahimi is trying to help. I would say about 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. I started to see a lot more panicked tweets, which I've never experienced on Twitter before. There were a lot of people who were losing phone service, that were not able to get through to 911, who were tweeting in emergency calls. 
I was getting a sense of the panic definitely through the words that they were using, the speed in which they were tweeting. I would get, you know, four tweets within a couple seconds of each other from the same person. Among the many tweets is a dramatic plea for help. A woman fears for the safety of her parents trapped by the floods. This woman tweeted very early in the evening that her parents were trapped in their home on Staten Island. And I told them that I was contacting dispatchers, but for them to also try contacting 911. Staten Island is particularly hard hit by Sandy. Many of New York's fatalities occur on this tiny island. Emily tries to save lives by using Twitter to send out vital advice. That night, it was mainly just trying to communicate to the people that if their house is starting to fill up with water, that definitely meant that outside it was even worse. It was moving extremely quickly. It was moving as if it was a river. It was carrying a lot of debris. So being outside your house in that situation without a rescuer there who could help you was probably worse than actually being in your house. This storm was definitely a 21st century storm. And this is really, I think, the first one that has used social media to call for help. That night, emergency medical services respond to almost 6,000 calls. But they're not the only ones pushed to the limit. Hospitals are also overwhelmed. On the Lower East Side, NYU Hospital has lost power and is evacuating over 200 critical patients. For these patients, this nightmare has become a matter of life or death. Manhattan is in a medical crisis. Breaking news from Hurricane Sandy, CNN's Chris Welsh is live now in Lower Manhattan. The situation that's most pressing may well be what's happening at NYU University Hospital. What is going on down there in terms of the patients? That's where they are now moving about 200 patients to various hospitals in the area because of these waters. You would never think this was happening in New York. So the best way to deal with now is just not panic. I mean, the NYPD is doing all they can. They have a lot of patrol cars going on every single block. People just got to stay civil. In New Jersey, Abby Wellington and Stephen Olufsen face a medical emergency of their own. There's no power in their house. The roads are all blocked. Abby is pregnant. She doesn't realize she's about to give birth. As the hurricane was starting, I was only days from my due date, so I was nervous. We had lost our power. We had no heat, but it was probably around 9.30, we get in bed and... I felt a little bit of pain, but nothing. it didn't feel like the contractions I felt last time. It came again maybe eight or ten minutes later. Then it seemed, okay, maybe something's starting. Unable to get to a hospital, they reach out for help to their neighbor, Jan. I get a text, come, the baby's coming. Abby is terrified at the prospect of delivering her baby without medical assistance. It was still scary and it was very dark. We had no power. Um, you know, there were just a couple candles on in the bathroom and I felt something. And we realized it was the bag of water and that the head was coming and that the, there wasn't actually anything wrong. It was just, I really was about to have the baby in half hour. The baby is well on its way. Stephen and Jan improvise as they frantically search the house for anything that might help. They even use clips designed to seal crisp packets to clamp off the umbilical cord. Within the hour, Abby gives birth by candlelight on her bathroom floor. Abby's delivery goes smoothly, but it could have been a very different story. This storm caused a lot of damage. A lot of people died. We're very lucky. Superstorm Sandy is not stopping for anyone. Not even baby Henley. A huge test for New York's emergency services comes at around 11 p.m. In Queens, down power lines spark a devastating fire that tears through the neighborhood of Breezy Point. Breezy Point's residents suddenly face a deadly dilemma as the fire spreads rapidly in storm force winds. Fleeing through the floodwater is a risky business. The alternative, staying put as their homes catch fire. 
70 mile an hour winds fan the fire. Burning embers the size of tennis balls are blowing from house to house. Whatever is not flooded is on fire. At first, there's no one to fight the blaze. The local firemen are trapped on the second floor of their own fire station. By the time help arrives, almost three hours later, Breezy Point is in ruins. Up and down the coast, communities are traumatized. Now, scientists are desperate to understand why Superstorm Sandy was so destructive. Despite the warnings, few had expected such devastation. Experts are now descending on New York and New Jersey to understand what happened. Wind engineer Tim Marshall is assessing Sandy's impact. Now we're coming up to Breezy Point area. The fires are out, but the true extent of the devastation is only starting to be realized. This was the scene of a horrific event, is as the storm surge came in and flooded all these homes, a lot of people were trapped. And then the worst nightmare you can think of happened. A fire began. The burnout area is over here on the right, wow. and we're going to take a look at this. So here we can see just this area of devastation, just all burned up. Houses are gone, trees are burned up, the poles are all burned up. Looks like about 100 houses have been completely torched all the way on down. The burned area actually started near the ocean and then burned right on through. If there were more houses beyond it, I'm sure that fire would have continued, but it went ahead and stopped right there at the parking lot. 111 homes were destroyed by the fire at Breezy Point. But by some miracle, not a single life was lost. Storm chaser Jeff Petrowski is investigating the damage. When the storm surge comes in, water has so much force, it does things of the unthinkable, such as placing cars on top of railings and posts, cars stacked on top of each other. During the peak of Hurricane Sandy, the storm surge at this location was about five and a half to six feet, plus the waves were on top of that, which just inundated this entire area. If you look at this, look what it did to this location. Shacks, wood, boards, everything was, was hit and inundated and destroyed. Residents are slowly returning to what's left of their homes. And we didn't move anything. This was just the water moving everything. The water was up to, it was up to the ceiling almost. I'm sorry. This was my refrigerator that I did actually fill up, thinking that, you know, if anything, we'll have, but nothing could have prepared us for this. This is the bathroom. We did keep everything nice. This was our home, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. Emergency services are still out on the street, helping bewildered residents to safety. Now, are you staying here? We're, um, uh, my husband's, he's staying here. We have a ton of stuff at the firehouse. I haven't been over there. Go I actually, there. I volunteered. Um, Whatever you need, go there. Yeah. We have a ton, we have blankets, we have flashlights, batteries, candles. I don't know what I need anymore, you know? <laughs> it's just. But go and take something. We have hot food there. Volunteer fireman Daniel Kavanagh spent the night rescuing people from their wrecked homes. We had one death, uh, actually a couple of houses away from the firehouse, closest to the water. He got trapped in his basement. 
From the air, it's obvious to Tim Marshall that some of the houses below could turn into death traps. This is the Jersey coast, and this is where Hurricane Sandy made landfall. This is what we're looking at right here. If we could swing around, there's the houses in the marsh over here. Yeah, there's like a house in the middle of that field, see it? There's several. There's oh, actually yeah, several yeah. houses. Yeah. And there's one sitting on the road there as well. Yeah, the man. top of the house is sitting right on the road. The water comes in with tremendous force. Your house is carrying all of its load downward, and when the waves come in, it basically cuts the legs out of the house, or the bottom out of the house, and the second story comes down where the first story was. These houses just simply lifted off their foundations and moved with the water inland. And it floated to that position there, right on the street. I grew up here. I've been here since I was born. This is absolutely sickening. Uh, this is memories and generations just washed away. They'll never be able to replace it, never be able to rebuild. Shock. Just, I heard one cottage had been um, taken out to sea, but then I found out there was four that are just like, they've just vanished. They're just completely gone. How am I going to get all this out? The borough of Seaside Heights is a picture of total destruction. Part of the dock here, you can see it's buckled up where the waves have come underneath it. It's like the impression of the wave itself has been captured by the dock being pushed up. Lower Manhattan was right in the danger zone. Sandy caused a record storm surge. 14 feet of water crashed through the city streets. I've never in my life living in New York City. You've never seen anything like that? No. no. The financial district's buildings did not have sufficient defenses to prevent flooding. New York's 108-year-old subway system suffered its greatest disaster. In some stations, water rose from track to ceiling. The reason for this mayhem is hidden beneath the streets. Historian Andrew Needham thinks he's worked out exactly why this area of Lower Manhattan is so vulnerable to flooding. This is a big story about the conflict between humans and nature, and it's a story that almost no one in New York knows. It's really amazing that the place we're walking right now was once swampland, part of the ocean. And it was made into property over a series of centuries when people dumped ground, they dumped earth, they dumped garbage, ashes, leftover material from the fires that raged in Lower Manhattan, really anything they could to make new land. Building on all this material has helped Manhattan expand over 400 years. But Sandy's powerful storm surge temporarily took the water line right back to where it started. I've just walked up from what the high water mark was during Sandy, and you can still see trucks on Pearl Street cleaning up garbage and pumping water out of basements. It's no coincidence that those trucks are down there because Pearl Street was, until the 17th century, the original shoreline of Manhattan. In fact, Pearl Street is named after the oysters that lay in the shallow areas near the shoreline. Oceanographer Simon Boxall knows that messing with nature can have disastrous consequences. As we've been pushed more and more in terms of space in our cities, and many cities are on the coastlines, so we sort of extended out into the floodplains, into the areas that nature has traditionally used to protect the, the land itself against storm surges, against hurricanes. So we're now living in the area that was the buffer zone, and that's the big problem. It's made worse in the case of the eastern seaboard because it's difficult to put up sea defences. All along the east coast, beachfront properties are directly in the path of potentially dangerous storms. 
it's desirable to have your property overlooking the, the coast, overlooking the water. But if you build along the coast, if you build in floodplains, if you build in reclaimed land, then you are at much, much greater risk. And you're always going to be exposed, regardless of what sea defences you put up, to the possibility of nature eventually taking that land back. But it's the frequency in which these things are occurring that we need to start really worrying about. And I think Sandy's been a, a bigger wake-up call for people in New York and along the eastern seaboard. This is unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. We often take things from nature, like the land on our coasts. Nature is very good at taking that back, and it's done it, in this case, with Hurricane Sandy. How did Hurricane Sandy turn into a superstorm of epic proportions? A storm that brought chaos to the Caribbean, then headed for North America. You prepare for the worst and hope for the best. That's what you do. And brought winds that toppled thousands of trees. We've never seen anything like this. No. The waves are triple the size of a human being. Sandy's storm surge pounded U.S. shores, altered the shape of her beaches. I grew up here. I've been here since I was born. This is absolutely sickening. And inundated her suburbs and towns with billions of gallons of ocean waters. She caused fires that raged through people's homes and stretched New York's emergency services to the limits. Just seven days earlier off the coast of South America, the storm was beginning to form. In this region, the warm temperatures of the Caribbean Sea allow trillions of energy-bearing water droplets to evaporate creating denser cloud systems, which can start to spin. As its winds reach 74 miles an hour or more, Sandy is branded a hurricane. The storm was a deadly threat, taking more than 70 lives and devastating Caribbean islands on its way. It was important to learn as much as possible about it. So the U.S. National Hurricane Center dispatched its planes on hazardous missions. We have a crew that will be leaving today and they'll be flying back to back. We have two planes, so one plane would fly and then the next 12 hours the next one would fly. And we kept doing this until it made landfall. So hopefully the data that we'll collect based on this flight pattern where we're going to drop all these different drop zones will help to narrow down that intensity and the track of Sandy. When we're flying on the P-3 Hurricane Hunter aircraft, it's essentially a flying laboratory. We are collecting drop zone data, which are these drones that we deploy from the aircraft. The probe parachutes down through the eye, measuring the hurricane's temperature, humidity and pressure, as well as wind speeds and direction. We knew that the data collected was going to help those emergency managers know whether to evacuate the people on the New Jersey, New York coast for Hurricane Sandy. The Hurricane Center's meteorologists were shocked by the data. Sandy was now in a different league. It was on course to create a larger system with frightening destructive potential. The data collected from the P-3 aircraft showed that the wind field was so large, it expanded m more so than what we'd ever seen in, in the last uh, decade or so. Normal hurricanes are pretty small and their wind field is pretty small, so it doesn't impact a very large area. Tropical systems are very concentrated. The winds are very strong, but it's very concentrated. So this 
dilution of the storm spreads that grief over a much larger domain. Its size actually made it very devastating. Meteorologists began to realize that Sandy was destined to be among the largest hurricanes ever to form in the Atlantic Basin. Hurricane Andrew was 180 miles in diameter. Katrina was even bigger. Then Irene, then Sandy, the largest of all. This was around about a thousand miles across, and that is huge, that's a superstorm. Hurricanes traveling off the eastern seaboard usually turn east and fade out over the North Atlantic. But with a weather front over Greenland and a low pressure system over the US, Sandy took a different course. The other unusual thing about Sandy is that it didn't recurve out into the Atlantic, which is what hurricanes normally do when they get up to the latitude um, of New York or New Jersey. Sandy recurved inward. If we have winds that are out of the southwest, that'll tend to recurve the system to the north. If we have winds that are of a different direction, that will tend to drive the system in that direction. Aware of Sandy's landward trajectory, authorities called for evacuation from its predicted path. They feared that Sandy would bring in a storm surge. Approaching land, a hurricane's wind drives water towards the shore. Wave after wave, hammering coastline structures and flooding city streets. Those waves aren't just created locally, they've been created as the storms moved across the Atlantic. So they're moving in, and so all of a sudden, we get 14, 15, 16 feet of water. Sandy's storm surge dumps 500 million tons of Atlantic water on New York City and the Jersey Shore. The moon provides the final piece of Superstorm Sandy's lethal jigsaw. The force of the moon's gravity pulls on Earth's water, fractionally lifting the surface towards itself. Oceans bulge towards the moon to generate two oceanic tides per day. During a full moon, the moon's gravity can align with that of the sun to produce particularly high tides. Superstorm Sandy made landfall just when a full moon was brightening the sky. That full moon, that high water, gave an extra six feet onto the sea level. Had the hurricane hit during a, a half moon, where we don't get the very high tides or a low water, we wouldn't have seen the amount of flooding on the eastern seaboard, inland, into the cities, into the suburbs. Sandy picked the worst possible time to hit. She hit an astronomical high tide. Sea level tides are gonna be higher than they would normally. At the same time, because of the driving wind, 14 foot storm surges made worse by this high tide. On the 29th of October, 2012, the coast met Sandy's full moon high tide storm surge. A vast wall of water rushed towards the shore powered by the hurricane's 90 mile an hour winds. Water is a very dense fluid, much more dense than, than air. Sandy had immense impact with regard to water damage due to, to the strength of the winds. And that pushed water into the lower parts of Manhattan. You just had a, a tremendous amount of water funneling into a, a small area. Cut off from the energy source of a warm ocean, Sandy very slowly lost its strength. But had this been the perfect storm? What makes it perfect is just that all the right ingredients came together for it to have a high impact. This really was a superstorm. I mean, you have the massive storm surge, the winds, power lines down, flooding rains, and believe it or not, in October, some places in West Virginia, 36 inches of snow, three feet of snow, and far away in the Great Lakes, thousand miles away, 
there were surfers riding 20-foot waves. Sandy was that massive. The entire east coast of the United States, as far back as Chicago and the Great Lakes, impacted by this storm. Extreme weather is affecting every part of the globe. In 2012, Russian agriculture suffers its second drought in two years. Record-breaking summer rainfall comes to Britain. And Venice continues to flirt with the sea. In the US, destructive tornadoes are rampant. and more than nine million acres burn in wildfires sparked by tinderbox conditions. Climate change appears to be real. Average temperatures have risen more than half a degree Celsius over the past 100 years. But can extreme weather events like Superstorm Sandy be linked directly to a changing climate? We're still trying to understand the effects of climate change and whether or not we'll see more storms like Sandy is still unknown. Coming from a scientist background, it's, we have to really look at it objectively. If you start saying that the rare event is becoming the common event, that to me is good evidence for something is changing. Now, that needs to be quantitatively done, not, not done in an odd, ad hoc nature. If someone can show that, then I'm on board with believing more of uh, the, the, the change aspects. Global warming means that there's more energy in our atmosphere, there's more energy in our oceans, and this energy is seen in terms of storms, and that energy means we get more extremes. Unseasonal weather, our seasons are changing. More hurricanes, heavier winds, more tropical storms. And it's this pattern of events that people are going to have to get used to over the coming decades and centuries. Nine days after Sandy, there is further bad weather for New Yorkers. A storm leaves tens of thousands without power in freezing temperatures. Is extreme weather something we should all simply get used to? Virtually every expert knows that humans are warming the planet. These same experts tell us that storms like Sandy are going to become more common in the future, combined with rising sea levels, which are absolutely going to happen. Those sea levels are going to rise for centuries. If the sea levels are rising, what do you do? You move up the hill. And I think the way forward is to look at how you relocate, how you redesign towns and cities for the next two or three centuries. Certainly preparation for these events is necessary and mandatory and not, you know, after they happen, but before they happen. Not all scientists agree on the causes of climate change. But one thing seems clear. Hurricanes like Sandy will visit again. Has some sort of tipping point been reached? We may not have too long to wait to find the answer. Uh, I don't know. I can't even, uh, I don't even know what to say. Um, I'm just happy that we're alive. There's, um, uh, we're all just sort of, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, power. There's no service. There's no phones. It's like a scene out of some end of the world movie. Um, and there, there's no exaggeration there. I don't even know how words can't describe it. Um, the boardwalk is gone, but, but we're okay. Um, we're just making fires at night in the street and cooking communally and trying to stay together and be safe and keep the block safe and that's it. Um, I don't think people understand exactly what happened in our neighborhood. Um, and we want people to know because we want people to come and help. Uh, anyway, thinking of you um, and talk to you soon. Love you, big kiss. Bye.